So I want to close by asking what it is that is apparently so frightening about Darwin's nature, this purposeless, non-progressive, materialist world of Darwin's theory. It was certainly perceived as frightening by many people in his own century and in ours. It seemed to take away that intrinsic meaning from nature that was once so important to many humanists in the Western philosophical tradition. I once did an article on the paintings of America's greatest landscape painter, F.E. Church, who virtually stopped painting after the origin of species. There were many complex reasons, part of which they'd become wealthy and didn't need to anymore. But it's perfectly clear that one of the main ones, because Church was a follower and a respecter of science, is that it was so important for Church when he painted Heart of the Andes and Cotopaxi and Niagara Falls that he'd be able to see nature as intrinsically imbued with coordinated meaning. And after Darwin, he couldn't anymore. Consider the poems of Thomas Hardy. is the best expression I know of that malaise, that the angst that was felt by so many in the humanist tradition when they had to face Darwin's world. It's a poem by Hardy called Nature's Questioning, where the angst is felt by the objects of nature. Hardy writes, when I looked forth at dawning pool, field, flock, and lonely tree, all seemed to gaze at me like chastened children sitting silent in a stool, and on them stirs and lippings near, as if once clear in call, but now scarce breathed at all. We wonder, ever wonder, why we find us here. So they're the objects of nature. We used to know why we were here. We were part of intrinsic meaning, but now we don't know anymore in Darwin's world. Well, look, I can understand the malaise. But I would like to end by arguing that it was wrong for the last century, it's wrong for this century, and that a better solution to this admitted psychological dilemma is the freeing of humanism from a constraint it should never have vis-a-vis -vis science. If you'll accept that uh, any well-constructed life needs somehow to combine an adequate knowledge of the empirical world as it exists with an adequate personal set of decisions about ethical and moral systems, if that is what we mean by wisdom, some kind of synthesis of knowledge and values, I should think that Darwin's world is the world we wish to follow. The earlier one may have been comforting, but it certainly presented a dilemma to humanist scholars because the implication is if, that if nature is benevolent, and intrinsically so, and has all the messages and answers, then the answer to moral dilemmas should be read passively from the constitution of nature. What does that leave to humanism, to philosophy, to religion? It's all sciences, then. Understand the constitution of nature, and when you get it right, you know the basis of morality at all. I should have thought humanists would always reject that, but they didn't. I think the current view, which is inspired by Darwin, is right and is freeing and is humanistic, tells us that the world of facts is what it is, and it's important that we know it, but can never be a source of direct moral knowledge, because ethical values come from a different source than factual knowledge. And therefore, though we have lost psychological comfort, that exciting message, because it makes us draw the source of values from our own intellect, should be valued by everyone, should be seen as a foundation of humanism. I think that's Darwin's position, it's certainly mine. Now, I think there are two ways in which Darwin approaches this fact value, because Darwin was well aware of the implications of what he was saying, and he was certainly not either a moral relativist or a moral dolt, as he's sometimes portrayed. And I think there are two approaches inherent in what he has to say. First is what I like to call the cold bath theory. That is, if you think it's wrong, as Darwin surely did, to use nature as a source of values, to think that values can just as I say, passively come from a correct understanding of the constitution of nature, then you might as well use the cold bath. That is, show people that even though it's really quite inappropriate to see nature as a source of moral values, just to convince people they really oughtn't to do it, show them how ridiculous nature is, how cruel, how petty, how inefficient nature often is, and then maybe you'll get the point across, even though the real point is that nature shouldn't be seen as a source of moral inspiration at all. So show that nature is dubious, show that it would be inappropriate. So uh, Darwin wrote to Hooker in a very famous letter in 1856. He says, what a book a devil's chaplain could write, he says. I don't remember his string of adjectives, but something like this. On the miserable, low, inefficient, and incalculably slow ways of nature. And then in the letter to Asa Gray, he gives his example. He says, I do not see how a benevolent God could so construe nature that an ichneumonid 
would feed within the living body of caterpillars or that a cat would play with mice. That's interesting, the examples that Darwin chooses to show that nature can be ugly if we look at it inappropriately in moral terms, which we shouldn't. That's always the main message. It's interesting that he chooses a cat playing with mice. I'm sure many of you have shared my inherent revulsion when you watch a cat taking a half-dead mouse and just battering it around. You know, what's it doing? Why? Until you realize that human moral terms are not the way to consider this phenomenon, whatever it means. The ichneumonid is, is an interesting one because it became the classical case in the 19th century. Ichneumonids are a large group of wasps who reproduce by the following, in human moral terms, though inappropriate, horrendous way. The mother ichneumonid stings a caterpillar, thoroughly paralyzing. It lays her eggs within the body of the caterpillar. The eggs hatch, and the larvae proceed to eat up the living caterpillar from inside, but very carefully, leaving the nervous system and heart to last, because they don't want to kill the caterpillar, lest the body rot. And then having eaten up the caterpillar completely, they emerge. Now, internal parasitism the movie Alien proves this, just strikes us with some kind of psychological horror. So the story of the ichneumonid was something that all natural theologians had to deal with. They had a lot of trouble. Some people said, well, maybe the caterpillar is anesthetized. Others said, well, caterpillars are such an agricultural scourge, it doesn't matter how God chose to get rid of them. <laughs> Others said, uh, but look at how carefully the ichneumonid larvae husband their resources. Would human farmers and other producers be so prudent? And so there are obviously moral messages there. But of course, Darwin goes right to the heart of it and says, if nature is full of these kinds of cruelties in inappropriate human terms, then it is not a source of moral instruction. That's the cold bath theory. But I, that's rhetoric, in the honorable sense of rhetoric. I think the, the proper our philosophical argument is the other one, namely that nature is just simple. Whatever it is, nature's been around for billions of years. We're, we've been only here for a couple hundred thousand. Nature simply cannot be a source of moral instruction. As I like to put it, nature is what she is, persistent, amoral, and utterly fascinating, not immoral or moral. And I think that was clearly Darwin's position. He writes at one point, respecting the issue of values, as a dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton, let each man hope and believe what he can. It is not a statement about moral relativism and that anything goes. What Darwin is telling us is the answers do not come from nature. Every man must strive to believe what he can from the source of his own understanding. And I think that is the right solution. I think it's ultimately freeing. Finally, I think the best expression of this was given by a 20th century poet who I think has been anyone else understood the essence of the Darwinian position, namely Robert Frost, who in a wonderful sonnet named Design tells the following story. A spider who is white and a moth has eaten a moth and left only the wings, which are white. And the two of them, that is the moth with only its wings left, and the spider are sitting on a heel all flower. Now, heel alls are blue, but this is a white heel all. So Frost looks at that and he says, there's got to be meaning in this. This is strange. There are three white objects all together. Each has a different geometry. The spider, he says, like a puff. The, moth, the, the moth's wings are like a plane. And the flower is like an explosion. And the heel all is supposed to be blue anyway. So it must have intrinsic meaning that the, the three white objects of different geometries are together. But then he realized, my goodness, if it has intrinsic meaning, what's the meaning? Look what's happening. Spider's just eating this moth. And that leads to this wonderful last couplet of this sonnet. He says, he says, if it is design, he says, what of design? Let me get that right. He says, what but design of darkness to appall if design governed? in a thing so small. Now think about it, because that's the solution. That's one. What, what but design of darkness to appall? I mean, if there is design there, it's darkness to appall. But then he realizes the solution. If design govern in a thing so small. No, design doesn't govern in a thing so small. This is the world of nature. Now our hardest problem is we can see the spider, the heel, and the moth as a thing so small, and therefore not subject to any larger notion of design of such there be. The hardest thing is to break through our parochial arrogance and to realize that Homo sapiens on this earth is also a thing so small. Just one more contingent species, one little twig on this enormously arborescent bush of life, which, if you could replant it from seed, would never grow anything like us again. Once we come to that understanding, that Darwinian understanding of our own role in this universe, it will be much easier to see the important moral implications of Darwin's theory and its granting to us of the freedom that humanists need.
to understand the source of moral values from within ourselves and to leave nature for what she is, as I said, endlessly fascinating, amoral, and mightily persistent. Thank you.